Ladies, gentlemen, uh, small children, <laughs> welcome to Bayes. It's lovely to see you here on such a, a wonderful uh, and important day for us, which is uh, Paolo Aversa's inaugural professorship lecture. It's the first of these we've done, I think, for a long time. Um, so we're really looking forward to it. Um, my name's Andre Spicer. I'm the Dean here at Bayes. I've been in this role for around about 18 months now. Uh, and this is one of the great pleasures of, of the job is to sort of um, highlight our, our great faculty. So um, there's, as I said, I mean, Palos had a kind of an amazing career with us from joining us as a postdoc around about 10 years ago. 11 years ago, okay, uh, through to now. So um, he's sort of risen through the ranks uh, and enlightened many people, colleagues, students along the way. Um, and in that process, I want to try and convince you of one thing, that he's developed uh, something which we might call aversian innovation, right? Um, now, let me tell you what I think aversian innovation is. Uh, you know radical innovation, which is, you know, when this first smartphone was invented, a radical new form of communication. And, you know, incremental innovation, which is adding the fifth or sixth or seventh camera to the smartphone. No one really needs it, but we get it anyway. I think aversian innovation is somewhere in the middle, and it's quite different. It's a kind of innovation where you take something you're passionate about and you care deeply about, it's maybe your hobby, and you work on it, you develop it, you develop it with friends, uh, and then it becomes a business, a livelihood, and a global industry. So I want to try and convince you of this before we hand over to Davide. Now, I think this has kind of three components. Aversian innovation's got three components. One is passion. The second one is place, and by that I mean community. And the third one I think is play. So let's go through this, and this is gonna be three events I remember with Paolo and three papers of his, which you'll probably talk about. The first one is I remember meeting Paolo as a, a postdoc at the Artillery Arms. And he sits down and he buys me a drink. He's kind of learned that in, in the UK, you need to buy someone a drink to get them talking, right? So he buys me <laughs> a beer, sits down, and then he begins talking. He tells me all about this database he's got and his interest in Formula One and motorcycle racing and all of these kind of things. And the thing I came away from this was two things. Well, here's a guy who's overwhelmed me a bit about motor racing, which I don't necessarily care about, but, <laughs> but his passion made me care about it, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, it, it connected very well with, with his interest later on. So he went on to write a paper, which was about the rise of the motor race, the Formula One industry in the Thames Valley. And what this shows, I think, with some colleagues, uh, it showed that people are often able to turn what was a hobby, which was effectively racing, into a global industry through that passion for the hobby. So I think that's the first component of, of aversion innovation, passion, which Paolo, as all of you know who know him, has that in spades. The second part, I think, of aversion innovation is place and community. So m many of you just raise your hands if you've been members of the Bays or Cass Pizza Club. Okay, what did that involve? It involved getting a group of people together and convincing them to frequent uh, the pizzerias in the local area and drink as many Camparis or whatever you're having <laughs> as possible. Um, but what it was really about wasn't the pizza. It was about building a sense of community around us. And Paolo very much led the way in doing that. It netted people together, and I'm sure it gave rise to many great ideas and, and innovations from this. And lo and behold, Paolo also has a paper on this, which is about the alpine climbing, right? Which is people going to an area, a place, developing relationships, turning that passion into a global industry. Final component of aversion and innovation, which is play. Um, and I was introduced to this component through the unfortunate experience of nearly being poisoned to death by your students. <laughs> One thing which Paolo runs every year is something called the Bayes or Cass Strategy Bake Off. Uh, and what that involves, have any of you been members or baked one of these cakes? You've been a taster. You've baked one of those cakes, okay? So we've got some bakers up the back. Now, every year, these bakers often make a big mistake, which is, I'm going to create the newest, most cool, fancy cake in the world, right? Which is a Bloody Mary cheesecake uh, mixed with toplet, chocolate sprinkles uh, and a side of fish uh, hummus for, 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 for good measure, something like that. And every year, poor faculty members sit there and Augie always, 
eats it and nearly falls to, falls to the ground, poisoned by the disgusting flavours of it. There's normally one which is okay, and normally they've, they've done a little bit of innovation, but not too much. Uh, and uh, first of all, this is an interesting process of playing and learning through play. But again, Paolo has a paper on this, which shows us through Formula One racing, the companies which succeeded the most didn't innovate very little or didn't innovate a lot. They kind of found the medium way. And so too with the, with the Bake Off people, they found a medium level of innovation tended to do better. So next time you go out there and are thinking about uh, things going on in the world, think about this aversion in innovation. And uh, I think we'll see some interesting things coming. So congratulations, Paolo. It's a great honor to have known, uh, to known you, seeing you develop through these years. And I look forward to, to hearing more. So I think I now pass over to Professor Ravasi to, to say some words. It, it is an honor and, and a pleasure to introduce Professor Paolo as his inaugural lecture here today. Paolo has not just been a wonderful colleague during the five years that I spent at Bates, uh, back when it was still called CAS. Paolo is also one of my closest friends, a friendship built on shared passions, shared experiences, and shared values. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Many of us, and indeed quite many other members of the academic community, uh, know Paolo for his uh, extroverted, <laughs> gregarious side. For being, let's say, the life and soul of many, let's call them collective celebrations, that <laughs> serious uh, scholars engage in occasionally as part of their annual scientific gathering. And as a serious scholar myself, I can reassure that this statement is backed up by robust qualitative evidence, uh, including repeated participant observation, although I'm afraid I have no field notes that I am at liberty to share, <laughs> multiple ex post semi-structured time semi-conscious interviews, and considerable visual evidence in the form of several pictures that I will not be sharing today. <laughs> because they may distract us from the fact that Paolo is also a great scholar. Let's have a quick, a look, quick look at his accomplishments. After graduating from the University of Bologna, Paolo spent a year as a postdoctoral research fellow at Ward. Not only won a prestigious Marie Curie Research Fellowship, his work was shortlisted among the 10 projects with the highest impact on the media. His work on Formula One positioned him as the leading academic expert in motorsport industry, and he has collaborated with some of the most important companies in the sector, like McLaren and Toros. In 2018, he was recognized among the top 40 professors under 40 by Poets and Quants, which shows the respect and appreciation that Paul enjoys among the students. His recent publication record is striking, with eight articles published in some of the very best journals between 2021 and 2022, which is particularly impressive if you consider that he was also the director of the MBA until 2021. Paolo has received seven outstanding reviewer awards at the Academy of Management, and this is a true sign of dedication to help other colleagues improve their work. And he is now an associate editor of the Journal of Management Studies. His paper on catalyzing places that uh, uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, published in 2021 in the Academy of Management Journal, is now used as an exemplar of qualitative research in doctoral seminars and professional development workshops. And what is particularly remarkable about this paper is that, as we will probably hear later, it started as a master thesis. And this is something I always admired in Paolo, his capacity to turn a task, the supervision of master thesis, that many of us consider a boring waste of our time, into an opportunity to gather data, leading, in this case, to several high-level academic publications. And these are just some of his achievements. What I think it is important to recognize here is what stands behind his achievements and what makes Paolo an exemplar of the kind of scholar that we need today more than ever. When asked to describe Paolo in the past, I use words like warmth, sociability, enthusiasm, 
energy, creativity, but also determination, rigor, thoroughness, competence. All it is that think of power and all around, or red all around in your job. Somebody who is able to excel in research, teaching, and societal engagement. Paul is not only able to publish in the best journals, he is he's also highly visible in the media, well connected with the industry. He's a rare example of a scholar that is able to speak to the world of academia and practice, to conduct research that is interesting for fellow academicians and the press. And let's not forget, he managed to get himself a position on the board of an international wine producer, <laughs> paid in bottles, I understand. <laughs> and to persuade them to sponsor the party that will follow this lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and that is far more difficult than publishing in AMJ. <laughs> in a world where impact is becoming increasingly relevant, this capacity to bridge the worlds of practice in academia is an uncommon and precious quality to have. And this is another trait that I always admire in Paolo. Indeed, there are many other qualities I admire in Paolo. His inventiveness in designing educational experiences for master students, so the great class uh, and professional development opportunities for younger scholars. His capacity to select unusual research settings like early car races, rock climbing, or the history of, Con of the Concorde, that are both theoretically insightful and incredibly interesting to study. In fact, Paolo, it isn't about time that you and I start the project today, <laughs> after all this is. But you came here to listen to him, not to me. So I think it's about time that I bring this introduction to a close, and we'll do so by inviting you all to welcome Paolo. <laughs> <laughs> of all things I should have carried with me today, I didn't carry tissues. So I'll try to, to remain serious and composed. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the leadership at City University of London and Bayes Business School for granting me the opportunity to deliver this inaugural lecture. Despite being a school with a long history and rich traditions, Bayes Business School has only recently begun the practice of hosting inaugural lectures. And uh, therefore, I'm particularly grateful to our leadership for offering me the chance to be part of the first of what will undoubtedly become a long-standing tradition at this esteemed institution. I would like to thank our Dean, Professor Andre Spicer. By the way, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Andre. <laughs> for his kind and generous introduction, and uh, Professor Davide Rabasi, Director of UCL School of Management, a friend, first of all, for his friendship and support tonight and through all these years. I also extend my thanks to all of you, distinguished guests, fellow faculty at base, colleagues, co-authors, students, yeah. friends, and family members, yes, <laughs> for your participation, whether in person or remotely. Lastly, I would like to express my appreciation to the event team, particularly to uh, Aidan Gipp and Matthew Drew, who have worked hard behind the scenes to make this, le this lecture possible. The promotion to the position of full professor is undoubtedly one of the most significant and memorable moments in an academic's life. For me, this inaugural lecture represents a wonderful opportunity for celebration and reflection. To be present here tonight, some of you have traveled from other countries, while others have made their journey from different parts of London, which due to the ongoing strike uh, might actually take longer than coming from another country. I have pondered how I can potentially reward your care and attention with something that aligns with your hopes and expectations. Yeah. I ask myself, why are you as guests here tonight beside the wine? I believe there are three, at least three reasons. First of all, you might want to understand the research I have been conducting all these years and gain insights into my perspective on the world of strategy within and beyond academia. I acknowledge that my parents at home might still wonder about the nature of my job. <laughs> Mom, dad, this is what I usually do. I stand on a stage and I talk, 
talk, talk. <laughs> you might say that this is what I did for the first 21 years of my life when I lived at home. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, it's what I did when I lived at home, but now I've chosen to do it in a different country and in a different language. And uh, this is to spare you uh, from the headaches that my hyper talkative and hyperactive uh, nature caused you. Mom, dad, you showed remarkable patience with me, almost as patient as my wife, Catherine. You did a fantastic job and I will never find enough words to express my gratitude. For those who have... For those who have come to uh, learn about research and the future of the field, I will endeavor to explain uh, my research agenda to date and going forward. Most importantly, I'll present what motivated me to pursue it. However, I may shy away from making normative assertion about what management academia should be focusing on. Um, there are many individuals far more intelligent and experienced than myself, some of whom are sitting right here in this very room, who can provide such insights. I will limit myself to suggesting now how we as social scientists and maybe educators can perhaps approach our research, pedagogy and social role. Second, some of you may be curious about my personal journey, hoping to learn something new. Perhaps you would like to know the strategic decision I've made in my career progression and the choices I have taken along the way. You may even hope to find something applicable to your own lives. That is why I've structured this lecture as a brief journey through my life and choices. I will strive to explain how certain theories and studies I've conducted are closely intertwined with my personal experiences and the decisions that led me to this point. I will introduce you to a small selection of my studies, some of which I consider not only personal, but to a certain extent autobiographical. However, and especially for the younger individuals in the room, I warn that my life and choices should not be seen as a, or taken as a model. However, I hope that within the nonlinear and serendipitous events that have brought me to this day, you will find something useful for your own journey. Thirdly, you might be here to celebrate the achievement of someone dear to you, someone close uh, to you, whose celebration are as renowned if not more so than his academic contributions. If this is the case, do not worry, we will celebrate together. I would like to express my gratitude to the leadership at Zonina, in particular Pietro Mattioni, uh, CEO of the group and base modular MBA alumnus for sponsoring the way reception that will follow this lecture and that gives you an excellent reason to make it to the end of my speech. The title of today's inaugural lecture is Competing in Turbulent Environment Between Passion and Performance. The title encapsulates several words that reflect my personal and scholarly interests. Competition. Those who know me probably agree that I'm quite competitive and I consider my present self to be my biggest competitor today and constantly striving to surpass it tomorrow. I have also been fascinated by competition in general, the dynamics involved uh, and the cognitive and emotional biases that come into play when multiple parties race for the same goal. Competition is a core topic within strategy research, as most companies operate under conditional limited resources and zero-sum games. This calls for a better understanding of how, how executives can optimize their decision to achieve superior returns. Turbulence. I, like all of you, have been living in times characterized by turbulence and crisis, political, financial, environmental. From climate change to political instability, the pandemic and economic recessions, these are undoubtedly very turbulent times and research on adaptation to turbulence remain a relevant and timely topic for all of us. At the beginning of my academic career as a strategy scholar, I often conceptualized turbulence as a punctuated disruption rather than a stable, uh, or, or of a rather stable equilibrium, which pushes agents to readjust the approach, position and activities. In other words, I assume that equilibrium or moderate dynamism was the status quo and turbulence was the exceptional shock. However, as I progressed in my research, I realized that in modern fast paced societies, turbulence might represent a permanent state, constantly changing the status quo in terms of magnitude, frequency and nature. In other words, the ability to adapt and navigate turbulent times should be a standard requirement for individuals and firms. 
The adaptation to rock landscape and changing condition is also a classic topic in strategy scholarship. With its roots dating back to the Carnegie School and the works of Sire Mar uh, Richard Sire, Jim March, Herbert Simon, and the evolutionary theory defined by Nelson and Winter, these scholars theorize how firms and industries change their structure over time in response to variations in the environment and have laid the foundation of some major scholarly conversation to which I'm also part. Passion. Passion is an emotional condition typically theorized at the individual level, level, but extendable to groups and organizations, which accurately describes both my approach to the academic profession and my own interest in specific organizational phenomena. Simply put, I always been passionate about theorizing from the investigation of my own personal interests through the lens of a social scientist. Among these phenomena, I have given particular attention to settings where individuals display an attachment to certain activities that go beyond mere economic rationale. Sports, and among these, Formula One, are examples of competitive and turbulent settings that I'm passionate about, where actors display a level of personal attachment that often transcends mere economic returns, and it represents a major driver for performance. Passion in the management literature is usually defined as an emotional attachment to an activity, technology, or product. Works by Melissa Carden on the concept of entrepreneurial passion, for instance, shed light on the psychological biases and predisposition in entrepreneurial decision making. Management research addresses these aspects directly through behavioral theory and the Carnegie School and its more recent development advanced by neo Carnegie scholars, which according to Giovanni Gavetti and co-authors, combine and contrast evolutionary and cognitive approaches to strategy. It is thus fair to say I mostly adopt a neo-Carnegie approach within theoretical interest at the intersection of behavioral theory of the firm and the evolutionary theory. Particularly in recent years, my investigation has focused on innovation and the evolution of industries and ecosystems. I have been primarily drawn to technology-driven settings, exploring phenomena such as radical innovation, digital transformations, and business models. These topics have been examined through a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods. In many cases, my explanations have dwelled into intangible microfoundation, such as cognition, emotions, and socially constructed processes. I usually define myself as a qualitative storyteller with quantitative appetites. My preference for processes and storytelling will now prove viable in retracing the journey that has brought me, to, brought me here today, defining my scholarly identity in terms that I've just used. But first, please allow me to share a friendly note to the PhD students and junior scholar in the room. If, when considering more senior colleagues, you wonder how to build what seems a fairly consistent scholarly identity, don't be fooled. Many research careers develop serendipitously, and apparently coherent research profile is an ex post rationalization of a rather scattered set of questions and interests. Mine is no exception, and the journey I did to get here is as unorthodox as it can get. Still, I sort of got where I wanted to get, which means that if I can make it, anybody can, you included. I was not expecting to be here tonight. If one told me when I started my PhD at the University of Bologna in 2008, that a few years down the line, I would have become a full-time professor in a renowned institution in the city of London, I would have probably not believed it. I grew up in a modest family in Italy. They gave enormous importance to education, but no one in my family had pursued an academic career. My father worked as a civil engineer and a high school teacher in Vicenza, a provincial town in Veneto region. My mother is a housewife. As a result, becoming an academic has, no, has not been among my options until my mid twenties. Most of my aspiration derived from the interaction with others. I inherited the passion for motorsport and Formula One from my father, with whom we used to watch races since I was a child. Football has never been big in my family, but my father still, um, still today hangs a huge Ferrari flag outside our home in the small and beautiful village of Costa Bissara when Ferrari wins, which is practically never these days. <laughs> so I grew up with the idea I wanted to know more about the Formula One world and possibly have a job related to it. The drive for excellence came from my mom, which kept repeating to me, 
do whatever you like, no matter how different or niche, but do your best to be among, among the best at it. If you are the number one at something, someone will give you an opportunity, no matter how unusual your idea is. The passion for investigation instead came from my mom's uncle, which basically was to me the grandfather I never had. Uncle Franco was a high caliber public officer who spent his life focusing on his passion, culture. He had transformed an entire flat in Rome in a personal library where he collected books of any kind, including antiquities. Since he and his wife loved children but could have none, my parents used to leave me at their place for weeks during school's holidays, and I was spoiled in the best possible way with endless patience and attention. We were in the pre-internet, pre-smartphone, pre-Google era, where answer mostly resided in books. Whenever I had a question, may this be about science, history, sport, my uncle Franco replied, let's go and find the book where the answer is. We would search in his library and we could, if we could uh, find no answer, we would move to a public library or a bookstore. Once the right book was found, it would make me read the answer, discuss it with me to make sure I understood and we had the same understanding, pointing out unresolved aspect of the answer we had found and then gifted me the book that contained it. Consciously or unconsciously, he passed on to me the love for good questions and research. Still today, every time I celebrate a research accomplishment, as tonight, my thoughts goes to this caring man and his priceless gift. With these life learnings in my pockets, in college I chose to study what I liked, communication science an eclectic subject that combined learning from humanities, sociology, psychology, and economics. I had no specific idea about what kind of job I would have done with such a degree, but communication seemed particularly relevant and suitable to me, and I thought it could maybe uh, land in a marketing-related job in Formula One or motorsport firm. And this is why I also like marketing. The truth is that probably due to its eclectic nature, this was, and probably still is, one of the most stigmatized degrees in Italy. And graduates from this degree are often seen as hardly appointable in any job. I decided, decided to keep motorsport as a hobby and co-founded the racing team of my college institution, the University of Padua, where I've also served as a racing driver, arguably a mediocre one, with zero money and way too old already for a serious career. I also went on to pursue more education through some master's degree, which were shifting towards the business domain while working full-time in various managerial positions in automotive, biotechnologies, and other industries. Among the list of jobs I have done to make a living while studying, I can include caricaturist, drawing teacher for children, guitar player in bars, sales rep for a company of artificial limbs, mattress tester, waiter, and dishwasher in a Chinese restaurant. While gathered for my inability to transform my passion for motorsport into a related job, I truly enjoyed continuing my education. And in one of these masters at Coa Business School, I met a professor of strategy, Andrea Liparini, that appreciated my passion for learning and suggested me to enroll in the PhD in the management of University of Bologna under his supervision and become a full-time academic. It sounded like a valuable proposition. In the end, I like studying, I like teaching, and I adored the intellectual personal freedom that came with it. Again, a serendipitous choice. Had I found a decent job in motorsport, I would have probably never become an academic. I started my PhD in Bologna in 2008, and I was also co-supervised by Professor Gianni Lorenzoni and Simone Ferriani, which incidentally, today hold position here at base, giving me the exciting opportunity to be a colleague of some of my mentors. Coming from the world of business and being in love with empirical phenomena, I started pursuing my research question with a practical eye, rather than from gaps in the theory. Moving to Wharton University of Pennsylvania in September 2009 allowed me to engage with scholars close to evolutionary perspective and a behavioral theory of the firm. Dan Lavintel, Sid Winter, Ian McMillan, Nikolai Sigelkov, and others who gravitated around the management department, such as Gino Catani at NYU, Jay Ananda at Ohio State University, and Giovanni Gavetti at Dartmouth. Their work and thinking strongly influenced my perspective on research, and they generously inspired me in many uh, of the, um, inspired me many of the ideas I worked on in the following years. While at Wharton, 
I try to replicate the success of my supervisors, which had been visiting scholars before me. In particular, I tried to follow the footsteps of Simone Ferriani, which during his stay had teamed up with a talented Italian student of the PhD program called Gino Cattani and built a data set on something he was passionate about, the cinema industry. With this, this, with this data set, Simone and Gino had published some important work. Then Simone won a Marie Curie Fellowship and moved to what at the time was Cass Business School to work with a friend and co-author of his supervisor, Gianni Lorenzoni, Professor Charles Baden Fuller, still a prominent member of the Bayes Strategy Faculty. Since imitation is the greatest form of flattering, I hope Simone won't mind I copied his recipe. When at Wharton, I made sure to team up with a talented Italian PhD student, Alessandro Marino, and built a data set on something I was passionate about, Formula One industry. With this data set, I published some of my early work. Then I also won a Marie Curie Fellowship and moved to what at the time was Cass Business School to work with a friend and former co-author of my supervisor, Gianni Lorenzoni. Again, Charles Baden Fuller. And I've been in this institution since then. Another person that deeply influenced my thinking during the three years in Philadelphia is Dr. Katrin Schreiter. At the time, a PhD student in history and today a full-time faculty member at King's College London. I met her in the university library. She taught me the pleasure and advantages of drawing from the past to interpret the present and sometimes even the future. And now she also taught me how to seriously use history and not that wishy-washy longitudinal approach that in management we consider historical methods. Our intellectual engagement was so theoretically, uh, theoretically meaningful and empirically solid, the few years down the line, we decided to co-author a paper, Mary, and have Lars, the blonde and loud baby angel you see in the audience. <laughs> Beside being my, wife my life companion, Catherine is still one of my favorite academics and the best unfriendly reviewer a management scholar could hope for. <laughs> My move to London in 2012 presented few unknowns, but was motivated by many known advantages and attraction points. After three wonderful years in the USA, I really felt my European roots calling, and I wanted to be back in the UK. At the time, the most open and connected part of Europe, a forward-looking country with a strong growth, a strong economy, and a reliable currency. <laughs> Citing John Lennon, life is what happens when we're making other plans. And it's incredible how, an un how unthinkable turn of events can disrupt our uncertainties and life. In my early years at BASE, I had the opportunity to publish research on how firms' technological responses adapt to turbulence in their competitive environment. While studying this phenomenon, I realized several aspects. Firstly, firms tend to underestimate and give insufficient attention and consideration to the influence of external shocks on their actions and performance. Even when they do consider these changes, they often limit understanding how the environment where they compete evolves, and they tend to lump together multiple dim dimensions of change. Therefore, in my studies, I aim to meticulously dissect various facets of environmental turbulence. One of my initial works published in 2015 in Organization Science challenged the notion that more innovation is always the best approach. This study, co-authored with Alessandro Marino, today an accomplished executive for an Italian football team, Luis Mesquita and Arizona State University in Jane and at the Ohio State University, examined the population of Formula One firms and regulatory changes over 30 years. We discovered the returns from innovation are not linear, linear, but rather curvilinear, following an inverted U-shape. This means that there is an optimal point of innovation that maximizes returns, but beyond this point, technologies tend to fail or underperform. Interestingly, as regulatory changes become more radical and challenging, the optimal point recedes. This suggests that when the environment changes more, performance is maximized at lower levels of innovation. This does not imply that innovation is unnecessary, or harmful, but that incremental innovation rather than radical innovation maximizes performance in times of turbulence. One reason for this is the cognitive overload experienced by executives who often struggle to manage the additional challenging, challenges of implementing radical innovation when adapting to regulatory changes. This, the key, key takeaway is that during periods characterized by shocks of major magnitude, it is cr crucial to keep innovation under control 
and focus on aspects within the organization knowledge base and the field of expertise. Venturing outside the comfort zone during these times of turbulence can be very costly. <laughs> Regulatory changes can vary in nature, including changes in frequency or magnitude, as well as per, uh, permissiveness or restrictiveness, which determine the firm's degrees of freedom for technological experimentation within certain standards. In a study published in 2018 uh, in research policy with my former MSc student Olivier Guillotin, we investigated Le Mans prototype racing to explore the impact of regulatory changes. Counterintuitively, we found that permissive regulation increased technological uncertainty leading to causal ambiguity between technological solutions and performance outcomes. This uncertainty reduced a firm's tendency to shift their technological trajectory. On the other hand, restrictive regulatory changes have the opposite effect by shedding light on the performance ceiling of the standard solution, thereby creating incentives for firms to pursue radically different approaches. While the earlier part of my research career focused on adaptation responses, such as the studies mentioned, and those looking at business model responses more recently, I have become interested in companies and industry original predispositions. Besides effective responses, adaptation can also be a matter of resilience. Some companies and industries are more resilient and adaptive than others, and this can be attributed to distinctive features that originated from their inception. One such feature relates to the emotional attachment an individual within these companies and industries have toward their activities, which often extend beyond economic interests. This emotional attachment can explain dynamics in various industries and business contexts, including the resilience of family firms, the motivation of businesses and institutions with a strong social purpose, and the dynamics of industry driven by passion, such as user communities turning the leisure activities into businesses. Excellent examples of these communities include scientists, hobbyists, and sport enthusiasts. This is what the primordial soup is indeed about. This study, published in 2022 in Organization Science with Santi Furnery here at BASE and Mark Jenkins at Cranfield University, explored what are the micro foundation of industries and tries to explain why certain agglomerations of companies and activities cluster in specific territories. Despite experiences, at times, limited or no institutional support and inferior labor condition. We found this, this an important contribution because, as evidenced by various scholars, among which my esteemed co-author, Maka Moin, at the University of Carolina Chapel Hill, most studies on industry evolution start with the establishment of the first firm and focus on the scaling up of firms and sales, while the incubation period preceding the business inception is less investigated and understood. How can we confidently identify the emergence of a new industry before the first business is actually established? In this study, we conduct an historical study, um, a historical case study on the emergence of the British motorsport cluster from the spontaneous and sometimes illegal racing activities of the Royal Air Force veterans during um, the, their return from World War II front and creating a series of racing clubs from which Formula 3 and Formula 1 teams emerged. The primordial soup of cluster genesis comprises a process characterized by, by two key mechanisms. Localizing passion, a shared emotional energy by which people become effectively and, and attached to the spaces where they carry on activities that they enjoy. And domain repurposing. The shift of a configuration of actors, uh, activities, and artifacts towards a new purpose, originating a new domain. Whereas domain repurposing induces the transformation of activities from leisure to business, the originating, uh, the, the, that's originating the industry at the core of a cluster, localizing passion anchors the activity to the same geographical area that's clustering the industry. The takeaway is straightforward. Passion builds resilient industries. And when actors experience in an inner pride and pleasure in conducting certain activities in a specific location, they related, they, the related business tend to remain in that geography. Enacting possibly a counter trend to the localization, remote working and industry dispersion. This is why understanding how to originate business agglomeration by identifying and nurturing leisure activities is and should be high on policymakers agenda. This paper was born lucky and it never got rejected anywhere. Still, from ideation to publication took nine long years of work. 
As tracking emotions of key actors that are no longer alive required discovering and digging into archival sources of any sorts, from private diaries and letters to club bulletins stored in some old member's attic. But it was very enjoyable and, I, and worth every minute I spent with my knowledgeable friends and co-authors. Besides, I consider it autobiographical. In the end, it tells the story of a group of motorsport enthusiasts that transformed their passion to professionalized industry to keep doing what they loved, which is pretty much what I have done when I decided to like motorsport as my prime empirical research setting. During my academic career, I have had the privilege of traveling to different parts of the globe and engaging in formative conversation with friends and colleagues in various organizations and academic institutions. Among the various destinations, Italy holds a special place in my art for obvious reasons. Returning to my home country not only allows me to reconnect with my roots, but also provides an opportunity to give back to a place that has given me so much. A very good education at an affordable cost, a supportive network that has sustained me throughout my, the years, and a wealth of inspiring research, ideas, and collaborations. It was during one of my visits to the University of Trento, situated near the Eastern Alps, that I observed an intriguing phenomenon, polar to the one I observed in the British motorsport cluster. The small town of Arco, loca located on the northern part of the Lake Garda, is globally recognized as the world capital of sport climbing. It is a legendary location, a legendary destination, where the sport was born in the 70s, and many of today's climbing technologies were invented, such as curved sole shoes and artificial climbing walls. Numerous world-renowned climbers have trained in the local mountains and regularly returned to the area to connect with both local and international athletes, exchange ideas, compete, and foster business relationships. Some of these climbers have, have even participated in the Rockmaster, the yearly sport climbing world championship held on official, uh, officially on artificial walls in Arco. Over the years, many of these athletes have become prominent figures in the sport climbing industry, assuming roles as entrepreneurs, product designers, specialized journalists, instructors, and influencers. They consistently attribute their success to the experiences in Arco, even though very few major companies have chosen to establish their presence in the area. This raises an intriguing question. Why do certain industry, despite ascribing their origin to a specific location, emerge elsewhere? To address this question, I collaborated with my friends and co-authors, Emanuele Bianchi, a former MSc student at base who initially drafted this paper as part of his MSc thesis, and colleagues Loris Gallo and Alberto Nucciarelli from University of Trento. We term these locations as catalyzing places that support industry emergence and growth through a cyclical process involving three forces, centripetal, catalyzing, and centrifugal. The centripetal forces attract community of practice to the place, exposing them to catalyzing forces, intense transformational experiences towards entrepreneurship. And finally, centrifugal forces, such as lack of agglomeration economies and access to portable resources, induce them to establish their business elsewhere. By redeploying the resources and reputation acquired in the place, these scattered communities enact a collective phenomenon of user entrepreneurship, ultimately leading to industry emergence. The paper is titled The Grand Tour, named after the practice common among young, wealthy European elites from the 16th century who visited various locations in the Italian peninsula to immerse themselves in cultural experiences. These inspiring journeys undertaken by major artistic and cultural figures such as Goethe and Dürer became foundational for some of the main artistic and intellectual movements, as well as the tourism industry in, in Europe. This study is also an autobiographical paper, as Italy has offered me countless grand tours, and I've considered it a catalyzing place for new research ideas. Regardless, I maintain the center of my life in London, where I found resources and structure more suitable to my scholarly production. The paper purposefully begins with a meaningful quote written by Goethe in a letter upon his return from his grand tour in, 90, in 1790. We are all pilgrims who seek Italy. We indeed often search places that can motivate us and inspire us with ideas, encounters, emotions. I'm grateful to all the individuals and institutions that have been provided such inspiration through my academic journey, including the base, business school, Wharton School, 
the University of Padua, Bologna, Trento, Venice, Stockholm School of Economics, and many others that have hosted me at various points. This study is dedicated to them and to and their exceptional faculty, students, and history. Moving forward, I have to admit, I have never placed much importance on academic titles. And I still feel that I have way more to learn than to teach, although I will have to do some teaching. <laughs> I see this promotion as a milestone rather than the culmination of my journey. Paraphrasing uh, the great Enzo Ferrari, my best project is the next one. While my research portfolio is expanding towards various directions, I maintain a constant interest in the evolution and adaptation of industries and firms, as well as the significance of intangible elements, such as emotions and cognition in responding to changing circumstances. I'm also committed to continue steering the conversation on using sports setting to advance management theory, a collective endeavor I started engaging with upon my arrival at base and that cuts across various management conversation and has helped me develop valuable collaboration with various colleagues such as Dimitri Sharapov and Jan Ross at Imperial College, Tom Moliterno at VU Amsterdam, Fabio Fonti at Neoma Business School and Martin Council Wall, and all the members of the Center in Sports and Business of the Stockholm School of Economics, of which I'm part. Although I do not consider myself a sustainability scholar, in recent years, I have also committed to explore how industries emerge um, by embracing sustainability imperatives and value propositions. I believe understanding how to adapt strategy to address global societal challenges should be at the forefront of every field of science today. And I hope to add my point of view of how strategy will provide unique perspectives for executives and policymakers engaged with these important goals. Strategizing to address grand challenges often requires complex coordination to align very different market and non-market stakeholders in ecosystem-like structures. For example, in collaboration with Juliana Reinecke at Said Business School, Alberto Nucciarelli at the University of Trento, and Martin Carlson Wall at the Stockholm School of Economics, we are investigating how regional tourism and winter sport industry in the Alpine area is changing due to global warming and snow melting. I'm also trying to reduce the selective bias in business academia that pushes us to mostly focus on successful cases and linear trajectories. Maka Moin and I are currently exploring why industry stalled and failed to take off, pun intended. To do so, we are conducting a historical investigation of the stall of the supersonic aviation industry, including Concorde, as well as its American and Soviet counterparts, the Boeing 2707 and Tupolev 144, respectively. Today, clear signals in the aviation industry suggest that supersonic transport technology may reemerge soon, thanks to more sustainable engines and fuels. Understanding why this industry initially stalled might help us avoid spending too much time up in the air, thereby reducing airspace congestion and pollution. As mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, I do not feel entitled to suggest what other scholars should be researching. It is evident that contemporary civilization faces pressing issues related to climate change, inclusion, migration, wars, and several related problems that if not addressed now, seriously, will severely impact our present and future. It doesn't take a cheering strategy to recognize that we should all dedicate our utmost attention to such needs and, as scientists, try to provide complementary answers uh, from our own <laughs> epistemological standpoint. However, besides this obvious remark, I would like to share my perspective of how management academics should perhaps consider approaching this profession. As someone wisely pointed out, good theories come from engagement with problems in the world, not gaps in the theory. I consider academic research as a circular journey. It begins with questions grounding societal problems. It progresses to a higher level of abstraction, theorization, and empirical sophistication to ensure rigor and generalizability of results, and ultimately has to translate back down to make it accessible and applicable in everyday life. When brought into the classroom, this learning should, be embed, should embed the debate that sparked them and not be presented as dogmatic truths. Science works when it remains an open, transparent dialogue, and it's through the development of critical thinking that we can nurture individuals capable of managing the complexity of today's life, evaluating fake news, and poorly assemble AI outputs, and coordinating the efforts required to implement the solution with your eyes to build a better world. I also believe that passion should be at the core of our research, not necessarily as a research topic, but as a labor of love for our beautiful 
privileged job, its hard-earned intellectual freedom, its impact on human life and the planet. Besides, without the love for our studies, we would never be able to endure the tortuous peer-reviewed process of which I, like many of you, am both victim and perpetrator. <laughs> In conclusion, I would like to express my gratitude and appreciation for the wonderful institution hosting us tonight, based formerly CAS, formerly CABS, City University Business School, whatever you prefer. As some of you may already know, after 11 years, I will soon be a formally based faculty member. And this in our lecture also served as my farewell lecture. It is with a heavy heart that I leave behind a terrific groups of scholars, colleagues, and friends, which has been a remarkable example of how to build an amazingly enjoyable organizational culture over the years. I've greatly benefited from being part of this group, and I hope to have reciprocated with my passion, dedication, and reasonable account of academic achievements and parties. The strategy faculty has welcomed me under the benevolent and insightful guidance and leadership of Professor Charles Baden Fuller, and has offered me opportunities to learn and collaborate with many colleagues. Although I cannot be certain, I may hold the record for the highest number of published co-authorship within the base faculty, more than 20, if my calculations are correct, five of which with my long-term friend, best man, and co-author, Professor Stefan Affliger, which you see in many of these pictures. It has been an exciting journey that I will always remember fondly, even though my, my, our paths might diverge from now. Ex excitement and passion have always been my driving forces, leading me to new places and adventures. Talking about crossroads, among my favorite poems, The Road Not Taken, by Pulitzer Prize winner Robert Frost comes to mind. Two road, roads diverge in a wood and I, I took one last travel by. And that has made all the difference, he wrote in 1916. Well, I didn't necessarily take, I didn't necessarily took the road, road less traveled by, no. But rather the one that seemed most exciting and meaningful. And that, without a doubt, has made all the difference to me. And hopefully we'll do the same for you if you fuel your journey, no matter how turbulent, with genuine interest, excitement, and passion. Thank you for your attention. I heard there are some reviewers, two questions uh, waiting for me, so I'll be happy to take some of the, the questions. One of the things I always known about is the capacity to bring in people. And I mean, in terms of finding solution for others, finding solution for yourself, but also in the purpose of developing yourself. So we met when you came to London first. I was sleeping in your living room. <laughs> That's true. I remember. Um, <laughs> how much in research benefit have you got from actually creating this network to nurturing them to the extreme of night and, and days? I always tell to my students and Francesca is probably here to, to hear that because I, we were talking about this um, exactly yesterday that I think this job is 50% uh, intellectual acumen and 50% social network. Um, there is no advancement in research without a dialogue. And there is no advancement in research without a true engagement. You know, this idea of locking yourself up in a library and writing a paper that's going to be perfect, and then Professor Ravazzi will accept it, it's never going to happen. He's going to reject it anyway. But, you know, besides that, it is an engagement, it's a conversation. It's a conversation. Without conversation, our brain is limited, our capacity to develop meaningful ideas is limited. And because we work on the edge of knowledge for our field, it is absolutely important. Besides, this is a, a job, I think, with um, a lot of positive aspects. And the most positive one is that it deals with human beings. Uh, the, I think the most amazing jobs in, in life are those who deal with human beings, doctors, uh, you know, uh, psychologists, professors, 
um, the, the final products of our job are uh, individuals capable of changing the world and uh, they make us incredibly proud. As a product manager, you will want to know how well your, you know, your cell phone performed or your car fare, you know. And at the same time, I always care to know about my students, where they end up, what they do. And I always tell them, you know, in 10 years down the line, drop me a line, tell me where you are. Every 10 years, drop me a line, let me know where you are. Let's stay in touch. And for example, it is fantastic, you know, when they come back and uh, ask for an opportunity to engage in a conversation, maybe in a collaboration as is happening with Pietro Mattioni, uh, the CEO of, of Zonin, uh, that is a former student of mine and with whom we started an interesting conversation that keeps going still today uh, in my say, role as board member uh, in the company. So it is by all means all about network. Hi, sorry, my name is Kiko and I'm from City University. Um, so your lecture was really amazing about how it shows about how passion can basically create any industry in any turbulent environment. I think the question I have is, what if you take it to the next level and how about using passion to create industries in near inhospitable environments? For example, I'm, um, well, to introduce myself, I'm from Myanmar. If anybody knows anything about the situation in Myanmar, it is a ongoing civil war there. And I guess on behalf of all the people, I guess on behalf of the special students, and future young people from places like Myanmar, Ukraine, that are facing more than normal means, uh, non-peaceful, very violent, very, and I guess a definition of an inhospitable environment. How, um, how do you, how does, in that case, how can your passion create something in that much of an incredibly inhospitable environment? So, um... I don't know if my passion specifically can, can create an industry, but I think passion creates industries and the inhospitable environments require uh, a passion for life that goes beyond the, the, the challenges posed by the environment, the, 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 pol the political situation and so on. Uh, I think uh, these, um, these areas uh, offer uh, terrific opportunities, for example, for companies with social purpose to create uh, you know not only viable businesses but a meaningful impact for the for the people at base we are we care much about about this and uh, we even have at the mba a module about which is called tech for good that runs in africa we precisely go and talk and study with entrepreneurs um, in in africa that develop solutions that are that change uh, human lives i remember one of the simplest but most uh, you know uh, interesting you know, things that I discovered, like there was an entrepreneur that was creating sterilized kit for circumcision, okay? Uh, thousands of people get illnesses and die in Africa every year because they, uh, you know, um, uh, do circumcision with tools that are not sterilized. S simple thing can change the world of a country, and the, the life, you know, this is, can make a world of a difference. So, um, these kind of ideas are groundbreaking, are disruptive. And I think the passion for changing lives is what can create industries. Thank you. Thanks very much for your talk. It was really interesting. I think there's, um, sorry, I'm Tom Sanderson from Shell, current MBA student or executive MBA student. Um, I think so much of what you just shared draws so many parallels on so many different levels with the energy transition and what's going on with oil and gas companies in particular. I was just wondering if you get any insights into how these companies can maybe think a little bit more about how they should transition or could transition in the coming, you know, 10 years, let's say. So, um, so I'm not an expert in the energy industry. I have a lot of energy myself, so I assume that I don't need additional energy, especially because it's very expensive these days. But uh, no, jokes aside, um, so I, I've looked into energy, uh, particularly uh, in the automotive industry, which is something that I usually uh, work with. Um, and one, one of the, I've been, let's say, uh, positively, uh, um, I reacted positively to the interest fi that final, finally came about, you know, reducing uh, gas emissions and, and re reducing, you know, the, uh, the global warming by, by working on, you know, carbon, uh, carbon emissions. Um, I've been less uh, enthusiastic about the way in which this is done, and I still have to see a proper study ecosystem level 
that shows that electric vehicles will actually reduce across the entire ecosystem the, the, gas, uh, the gas emissions. And this is a viable solution globally, not just for uh, those who can buy electric vehicles. Um, so if on the one hand, I'm very positive about this uh, renewed interest uh, and pressing need to uh, look at sustainable form of energy, I still think that we are a long way from resolving the problem. And uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, an ecosystem view of these kind of challenges is necessary. We cannot just measure emission by checking how much you know, gas emission gets out of a car, because that would be simplistic. And we, we can do better than that. We should be do, do better than that. Um, um, currently, I have a study with uh, Paolo Tatiki, Cristiana Pace, and Mark Michalides, for example, on the ecosystem of Formula Electric. And, uh, uh, and, and these kind of challenges, right, in the motorsport. But this is a problem that will interest other indust industries too. So I think looking at cutting edge technologies and, uh, you know, and making proper ecosystem level assessments before moving the technological trajectory to a new standard is a necessary condition to really tackle the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>